sewing machine has had the same history, a long record of sleepless nights and of poverty, of disillusions and of joys, of partial improvements discovered by several generations of nameless workers who have added to the original invention these little nothings without which the most fertile idea would remain fruitless. More than that, every new invention is a synthesis, the resultant of innumerable inventions which have preceded it in the vast field of mechanics and industry. Science and industry, knowledge and application, discovery and practical realization leading to new discoveries, cunning of brain and of hand, toil of mind and muscle, all work together. Each discovery, each advance, each increase in the sum of human riches owes its being to the physical and mental travail of the past and the present. By what right then can anyone whatever appropriate the least morsel of this immense whole and say, this is mine, not yours. So that was a quote from Kropotkin from The yes. Conquest of Bread. And we are here today to talk about fully automated luxury gay space communism. And uh, we've got one more person coming, but we had to start without them. So uh, the, you, the two of you who are with us, please introduce yourselves. Uh, hi, I'm Mark, uh, Mark Machani. Uh, he, they pronouns, and uh, I've just been really interested in socialism and automation and more of the state capacity side, uh, maybe more than Graham. Uh, and so that's how I came into this world of fully automated luxury gay space communism. Hi, I'm Joy. Um, I guess I'm just kind of along for the ride. I just find it kind of interesting. I'm not, I don't think. I don't know. I just, I find it interesting. So I'm here too. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess you guys can start by explaining um, how you came to be the chosen experts for the podcast Everyday Anarchism on fully automated luxury gay space communism, which I probably need to say less as the podcast goes along, but I don't want to. I want to say it as much as possible. There's not like a great way to abbreviate it either. So, uh, so at our school, uh, NCSSM, the North Carolina School of Science and Math, uh, we have the opportunity to sort of teach our own courses for pass-fail credit. And we decided uh, when Graham was still teaching at NCSSM to hold a course on fully automated luxury gay space communism. I want to say maybe we were talking about Oscar Wilde's The Soul of Man under socialism. We had a conversation in class. Yes. We, we uh, were. We wasn't were it in your... That inequality forum or your merit the meritocracy i think it was forum. the meritocracy forum forum yeah yeah okay yeah so we read the soul of man under socialism in the meritocracy forum and then we just kept talking about it and talking and talking and decided somehow to do a course on fully automated luxury gay space communism um but then it i quit started kind of as a joke didn't yeah it too? <laughs> yeah. yeah it was like kind of the joke. name yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, that's part of it. I mean, we can just address this right now. The name is ridiculous. And I think when I originally wrote up the class, it was like, this is a ridiculous name for a serious thing, but also it should be ridiculous. Like the future should be fun. This is one of the problems that I have with Marxists. Mark and I hopefully don't get into this too quickly, but too many versions of socialism don't imagine a fun future. <laughs> And fully automated luxury gay space communism sounds fun. You know, if Oscar Wilde came up with it, it's fun. Probably a little yes. too much fun. Well, I, I'm all for the embrace of fun and uh, sort of the embrace of champagne socialism, even as it is lobbed at socialists uh, to criticize them. What's the point of socialism if we can't have champagne? Exactly. Like, not that you guys can have champagne because you are too young and everyday anarchism does not encourage the breaking of laws. That's probably not strictly true, but not that one <laughs> um, in this case. Uh, and so then, and so then I quit and then, but you guys kept the course going. The course lived without me. Uh, yes, it did. So we had an effort uh, to teach the course in the fall that, uh, I guess ran into a few political roadblocks as any socialist project should. Yeah, we uh, found a sponsor on time, submitted the course, and then after holding our first meeting, we received an email that it was canceled. Um, 
and it went out to the whole student body as it went out to us. So we were kind of blindsided. Someone somewhere didn't want there to be a class on fully automated luxury gay space communism at the North Carolina School of Science and Math. Who could have thought this? I know, right? <laughs> and so we, of course, uh, readied our bureaucratic armies and demanded email, <laughs> uh, demanded meetings and sent emails and talked to the student body uh, or the student government to raise a formal issue. And we eventually got our course reinstated for the spring because there really is no stated reason in any of the handbooks for them to be able to cancel a course like this. Canceled for lack of resources. Yes, yes lack was of the official reason. That may be. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> lack of resources. Yeah, so they never actually said why they canceled fully automated luxury gay space communism and you guys were just like, no. And they, yeah. and the administration backed down. Um, yeah. Which is just, this is just such a hilarious story. Um, but that's, I, I, I wanted to start with this story so that the podcast listeners understand the dark forces arrayed against fully automated luxury gay space communism, which is to say the administration of a small meritocratic high school in North Carolina. But now that we've got that, let's get into it. What is fully automated luxury gay space communism? I've got to stop saying it so, so much. Where, where can we find it? I mean, it's kind of what it sounds like in a way. It's there's a lot of you know descriptive words. Um, I don't know. Uh, I guess I would say some common examples of it are seen in like partially. It's there's not. I would say like a form of media that encompasses like the whole name. But Star Trek, I think, does an okay job of getting like some parts of it. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's this idea that uh, we can achieve a post-scarcity world and our socialist or I guess communist project can be driven uh, by our ability to produce infinitely cheaply and without marginal cost to produce new goods so culture can flourish that's the gay part of fully automated luxury <laughs> gay space communism yeah exactly I like that that's the that's the gay part gay here mm -hmm. is standing in for the idea that people can do what they want and be who they want and that that shit doesn't matter anymore so if you look at you know all of the ideologies around identity ideologies about race ideologies about gender they're all in some ways about controlling the population and controlling resources and if you're in a post scarcity world in which things are no you can no longer run out of things there's just no reason to control people and control their bodies like that any more so that's the that's the gay part and I, I think the one example that you guys ended up really getting to in the class the closest one is this thing called the culture which is a series of science fiction novels mostly by this guy ian m banks but he apparently thinks fully automated luxury gay space communism isn't interesting so almost all the novels are about the culture like intervening to try and bring about fully automated luxury gay space communism in a different society they're not that focused on the actual lives of the people because because it's kind of uninterested like there's no conflict it's like what's the conflict everyone's happy and they play games and they switch genders and if one of them wants to build a new kind of ship they just do all right we've got one more uh member of our team to introduce the third leader of the class at NCSSM. So Rook, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, hey, I'm Rook. I use either pronouns. I was the third leader and yeah, I'm happy to be here. Wonderful, thank you. I will say this, this is the first time I've had any of my former students on Everyday Anarchism, but I'm hoping it's not the last. This is this is very this is very exciting for me at least. Okay, yes. go ahead, Mark. Sorry. No, I was saying it's also very exciting to be on everyday anarchism. <laughs> yeah. Even as not an anarchist. <laughs> Even as not an anarchist, everyone is an anarchist. Some people are just more in denial about it. Um, uh, so yeah, so the, the the space part I think is really because people like Star Trek. Like theoretically. Yeah. 
will go to I space, agree. but I think it's because of Star Trek. It's like why it's in space, I think. I mean, and I, I think guess space... there's also some of, oh, sorry, Mark. Oh, you go ahead. Okay, I think some of like the like fully automated part, especially because it talks about like the acquisition of resources, those could come from space, I feel like. Um, um, yes, and I think space is a symbol of the excess that uh, fully automated luxury gay space communism embraces. The fact that we can focus on these human achievements that might not have material ends, like exploring space and finding new worlds. Yeah, excellent. So the I haven't heard as much lately from the billionaires about how they are going to mine asteroids, but the billionaires are going to mine asteroids and they're going to do this uh, to make themselves really rich, I think. And in fully automated luxury gay space communism, I imagine we would mine some asteroids. But first of all, there would be no miners. No one would have to die in the sort of traditional sense that whether it's a capitalist or like a Stalinist system, the mining is done by someone, some people that you don't care about and they die. The fully automated part is that they the robots would do it. And then secondly, that resources, those resources would just be shared with everyone and then you know there's like lots of platinum in space yeah to make platinum valueless yeah and then it just doesn't matter and then like every every problem posed both by capitalism but i would say also by the conventional forms of socialism just disappear so in some sense you can argue this is a fundamentally unserious idea because it just wants to avoid every problem that has confronted humanity. But that goes back to that Kropotkin quote. We are super rich now as humans compared to how we used to be. And we can imagine keeping getting richer and we can imagine getting rich enough that none of our current problems related to the material world matter. But as Kropotkin would tell you, we're rich enough now for everyone to be pretty much okay and and we're not so that's the political element as well as the productive element sorry if i'm lecturing no um, you're not lecturing um i get we can talk about the pol the, the potential politics of fully automated luxury gay space communism but i think a more appropriate place for us to start would be i guess where we started in the course thinking about are we rich enough? And when we do become rich enough, uh, what what might be the futures? And so we opened with an article about automation that I personally did not enjoy very much. And then an article called For Futures, Life After Capitalism, which discussed once you get to that level of abundance and automation, where do you go up. forward? Yeah, I love this this idea this that, that there we, we have choices because this is one thing again that most versions of history don't say is that you have choices but we actually have options uh we, we should say the name of the article which i'm blanking on right now does anyone have it pulled up oh, I have the mother right jones article here. no the the mother jones article right that's the one you didn't like mark yes like Kevin it's, oh, it's four futures it's, it's just called four futures it's a jacobin yeah. article yeah yeah jacobin and who wrote it uh, Peter um, Phrase, yeah. and he has a book. This is sort of like the mini version of his book for futures. Yeah, okay, and we'll put a link to that. I'll put a link to that in in the show notes. Yes. Um, okay, so, and the future we want is fully automated luxury gay space comedy, right? Or do we want another worse future? I think it sounds pretty good. Uh, <laughs> I do like fully automated luxury stuff. The gay space communism is just a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I think we already do see, I guess, sort of a miniature version of one of the bad futures in Silicon Valley on the West Coast. That so there's just a filthy or even criminal amount of wealth floating around but because of hierarchy and refusal to build and engage in societal projects, you end up with this really toxic form of rentier capitalism. Excellent. 
So actually, a lot of those people really like the culture series, the Ian and Banks series, because they love the idea that you're going to have this fully automated future. And they seem to have missed the fact that Ian and Banks was a, you know, a strident <laughs> communist and uh, absolutely hated the, the, the kind of things they were up to. So that's one real danger when you're talking about fully automated luxury gay space communism. I find you get into kind of like Neil Stevenson, Elon Musk territory. I was talking to a buddy of mine, um, a good leftist who's like, yeah, kind of like Neil Stevenson, but all of his heroes are like tech bros. So that's one thing we've got to do is we've got to take the fun, exciting future away from the tech bros. Because Mark is right. The tech bros are running this future with infinite wealth and fully automated in Silicon Valley. And they have created the worst society in the world and exported it to us. And so when you see Silicon Valley, it's like, oh shit, technology is bad. Let's let's uh, have state socialism or let's go let's go all go live in huts and and be thorough. And that's not what we're trying to get, but if 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 automation looks like the world that Elon Musk and Google are building uh, on the so-called left coast of America, then we do not want to go down that road. Oh, God, it's so terrible. <laughs> yeah, yes, no, and I, I, oh, sorry, Mark, you can go ahead. No, I already said things. Oh. <laughs> Mark already said things. He will dominate. Um, I mean, yeah, generally, I agree. The while we're talking about this, um, I just keep thinking back to, um, was it 2020 that there were like three different billionaires all trying to build a rocket ship and trying to like go into space? And I remember seeing that. And at the time I was in your class and I was just, as someone who likes to believe he's very open to technology and open to innovation, that was just like maybe, maybe we should walk it back maybe i do maybe i do want to be thorough maybe i want to go live in my little hut and farm yeah that's i mean i mean to some extent rook i think that's the project is to like make a case that is for a a silicon valley style future that looks nothing like silicon valley um and one of them, I don't remember which asshole billionaire, but one of them took William Shatner to space. That was Bezos. Bezos. Yeah. That was Bezos. <laughs> They're trying to grab Star Trek and make it part of their vision. But Star Trek is a strangely military, but mostly a narco communist utopia. It's a narco communist as long as you don't work in the military. I mean, that's where you find the conflict, I guess, because, I mean, the stories about um, what we were talking about earlier, like, you can't find much conflict in those stories. So I guess you go to the, if you have a military, military exploration aspect. Yeah, this is one real problem we have is Star Trek is fully automated luxury gay space communism and we almost never see it. Like, because people think that no one wants to see that. So we really see just a few meritocrats on a, on a starship dealing with ethical issues and moral dilemmas when we know that the average person in the Federation just sits around and does whatever they want. But people think that wouldn't make for good TV. Maybe it wouldn't make for good TV, but God, is it the life I want? I don't want to be on the Enterprise getting shot by Romulans or being assimilated by the Borg. I want to just live in fully automated luxury gay space communism. What is so wrong with that? Yeah, the one episode you watched for the forum, um, it specifically, I can't remember the title, but it was the one where there were people who had been cryogenically frozen or like frozen in time and were now in Star Trek from the year that Star Trek was made because I don't know dates. <laughs> but, and I felt like that was a good glimpse into what the average life would be it. Cause they're just like, you know, what does this look like? You know, how do you do this? Oh, how does this work? And they're just like, what are you talking about? Everything is just like, do, do you want a drink? Press a button. Do yeah, you want, of, like... One of them wants a guitar. And someone's like, yeah, okay, computer, make him a guitar. And he's like, oh, so now we just get to have a party? And they're like... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's the, like, businessman who's like, where, where is my business? And they're like, what are you talking about? There is no business. The most we do here is just, like, expansion. 
Is that the neutral zone? Is that yeah, the episode? That episode, that episode? The neutral zone. The neutral yes. zone. Yeah. yeah, and the businessman actually, it actually turns out that he has, so in that episode, I do recommend anyone who's interested in this watching this episode, I'll, I'll put a link to it in the show notes as well. But that businessman actually has really good skills. He's like a really shrewd negotiator. And when they run up against the Romulans, he actually like advises Captain Picard and is helpful. And it's clear that he's never used those skills ever in his entire life, except for the destruction of other people and the creation of wealth. So that's one of the promises of this is like, you can still be like a hard ass negotiator. You're just doing it. There's no reason to do it just to be a winner anymore because everyone's a winner. So maybe you can be a negotiator. I, I don't know if, if you don't have, if you don't have wrong ones, maybe you don't even need that. But there's things you can do with your life that don't involve meritocracy, winning, the acquisition of stuff, which again makes it seem like a very, a, a vision that Bezos and Musk would not be down with at all. Yeah, it's just, sort of, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I'm not sure they're actually watching Star Trek. Like they, <laughs> they're like not watching happening? Star Trek. They just know William Shatner is a sir. They just want um, to <laughs> Yeah, they're watching it without any sense of the socio-political ramifications of it, maybe. Go ahead, Rook. This is like those people who are saying um, Star Trek like turned woke recently. But um, regardless of that, um, I was going to say it, it's sort of like the world that you dream of as a kid, right? Where it's... You just pursue your passion. It's not like your skills are useless unless you're like someone who wants to murder people. But you can negotiate, you can build stuff, you can paint, you can teach, create, do whatever. The only thing is, is that you're no longer having to compete with others for a place in society and for like your basic needs. And I think that's sort of what fully automated luxury gay space communism is all about. It's like you, we can still exist in the world. We just no longer have to fight each other for, like, fulfillment or our base needs. Yeah, and if you want to compete, you can. But it's not like if right now, if you compete in the meritocracy and, the, and you lose, you get way less stuff than someone else. And if you lose big enough, you starve and die. Whereas if you lose, you know, if you're in the poetry community and people don't like your poetry that much, that doesn't the, really matter. Yeah, that's the whole thing. <laughs> that's the end of story. People don't like your poetry. So if you're out there right now and you're a poet and you're like, oh, I'm going to have to work in real estate and give up my soul to do something I don't want to do, even though there's enough food for that person to have food and shelter for that person to have shelter, this idea is like, just let them make poetry better than having them go to law school. That's it. I mean, I, I like that, Rook. I mean, that's like the key thing. You can stop competing and fighting and still have your daily bread. Kropotkin loves bread. That's the important thing. Bread, bread, freedom is bread and bread is freedom. I really want bread. I've been baking some really good bread lately. Thank you, Mark <laughs> Bittman. Um, oh, for, from the Mark Bittman episode? Did he give you some bread up recipes well i mean i bought his i bought his book um, okay and was really enjoying it and then i was like what the hell i should see if this guy wants to come on the show and talk about bread and anarchism and he said yeah so i was making that bread first but i did get okay some. awesome so let's talk about Marx. okay i know mark wants to talk about Marx related mark. to automation <laughs> talking about mark <laughs> mark mark loves sparks this is just going to be us. I don't know if I love Marx per se, but <laughs> I, I, I like Marx, but most Marxists, most orthodox Marxists would not like me, I think is how I'd put it. Yeah, I think that's probably true. So I'm going to do the teacher thing real quick and set up like Marx on automation. And then I'll let Mark go with this really weird <laughs> fragment on machines thing, which is what we put together for the class. Automation, Marx basically says, is something that makes, um, or machinery, I shouldn't say automation. Um, machinery is something that makes work more efficient. So um, you can farm more 
if you have a hoe. You can farm more than a hoe if you have a tractor. So, and this is good, Marx thinks. I mean, Marx thinks the bourgeoisie is good in the era of his, in the arc of history, because they've made everything more effective. So machinery is good. The problem, this takes us back to our billionaires, is that when you create this tractor that makes more food, almost all of the additional food is turned into profit for the billionaire. And so even though the machinery has created this wealth, you end up with the same number of starving people or even more starving people. So the machinery is good in some sort of abstract sense for humanity, but within the capitalist system, it is bad and ends up not helping. It ends up just a way of extracting more uh, wealth while paying labor less. That's, the, that's orthodox Marxist thinking on machinery. That's like in Das Kapital. So, and then, so then we've got Fragment of Machines where he gets kind of weird, almost like poetic. What do you think, Mark, gonna start us here? Yes, uh, so in the Fragment on Machines, Mark sort of lays out this world, what will happen due to automation. And as the worker becomes less important, you sort of just go into the factory to watch the machine or press the button on the machine so such that production can continue. Yeah, and it's not even totally clear that the worker is needed. Yeah, the worker, the worker's role is pretty much entirely reduced. And M Marx is seeing this almost as an avenue for capitalism to end as value collapses due to the worker becoming even, even less and less important. Yeah, excellent. Joy or Rukio wanna continue? Any thoughts on this? I know Joy was just like, oh my God, this text is so dense. I should say, <laughs> this is a, this is a, this is from the Grundrisse, which is his notebook. Basically, it's his rough draft of, of all the stuff he wanted to write. And this would have been developed into probably like a hundred pages. But instead, it's like nine incredibly dense pages that Mark scribbled down. So if you're just like, I don't have anything to say, that's fine. That's totally yeah, fine. I mean, it was dense, but once I like unpacked it a little, I don't know, made more sense. Um, so like the like, I don't, we kind of looked into the planning section. It the like language reminded me of my favorite painting <laughs> called um, "Electric Production and Direction" by William Carp. I don't know, it's pretty cool. Reminds me of that. Um, and we can talk about this painting. Let me pull it up again it so I can cool, take a look at it. Kind of cool painting. It's like the like arms get kind of incorporated into a machine and like. You're not exactly sure what it's even doing at this point. It doesn't seem to have a clear direction. And there's like imagery of like an eye that's like watching the whole thing. The wires are crossed everywhere. I don't know. It's cool. Um, just reminded me of the. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, th I think this is a great point, Joy. And we'll put a, I'll put a link. I should be taking notes on everything. We have a lot of links. Notes. Yeah, well, this is, we're distilling an entire semester-long class into one podcast. But yeah. yeah, so this is the human becomes enmeshed with the machine. And the machine is like, you can think of it as an economic machine, like a machine of numbers as opposed to just a physical machine. But it's also an actual machine that human beings cannot escape, even though the point of machinery was to free humans from labor. This is that Kropotkin dream is that your ancestors worked so hard so you don't have to work that hard. And now we all seem to be trapped into these, in these machines that are trying to extract labor from us even though there's, there's plenty of food and shelter and wealth to go around. Labor and automation has been inverted and it's and it's terrifying. It's a it's a scary image. I don't know if you guys have seen the famous sequence um, in the film Modern Times. A lot of the listeners will have seen this, where Charlie Chaplin is working in a factory, and like first he goes insane, like he just like he's just um, 
just like tweaking these uh, nuts and bolts. And then he just like loses control of his function and just walks around and just tries to like screw everything, including uh, at one point he runs after this woman who has uh, buttons on her nipples. You don't actually get to see what happens, but it's a, you know, it's, it's a sex joke. And then um, he's, ch he's chasing her, trying to, trying to tighten her nipples. And then eventually he like gets caught in the machine and it looks joy really like this carp image of like the machine. This is an Oscar Wilde quote. Um, instead of a machine being enslaved to man, which is the goal, like the robot can just farm and we can sit around and wait for the champagne to come. Humanity gets enslaved to the machine. And that's the world we, we live in. We're like overseeing this machine that is supposed to give us something, but instead we have become its servant, even if we're calling ourselves its, its overseers. And I would extend that in this like abstract sense to the meritocracy itself. Like when you go to school, you're just part of that. If bureaucracy is a machine, you're just being sort of moved around. You're like Chaplin or like these hands in this carp painting. You're inside of it. And it was supposed to, I saw a poll recently of what people wanted from the American education system. And like the top response was like high test scores. And the very lowest response was like students find themselves or find what path they want to be on. So you you have become as students. Uh, Wait, quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Was it by was the like were the people taking the poll were they like students? No, 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 no. The American the educators. American population. Okay. Like they asked random people okay. what should school what should our schools be doing? And the answer is machinizing students. And that's I think again Marx is right. The the machinery of society is in charge now and you are judged by where you fit into that and it was supposed to be the other way around that's what makes fully that's one of the things that makes fully automated luxury gay space communism so transgressive it's like you're raising your hand in the back of the class aren't machines supposed to make life easier for us please no sit down and, and take your machine graded sat why is yep, my they... career dependent on a Scantron? I just want to ask why. Don't worry, little Timmy. Just shut up and tell us how to conjugate the verb. Yeah, that's exactly. So they can't even question. tell that it's better or worse that they removed the essay section. Personally, I'm glad they did. However, it's like, wow, does that make it like more or less like robotic almost? Nobody really read the essay. <laughs> yeah, no one. Why they removed the essay section was because they were teaching a computer to grade it. And once yeah. people realized that the algorithm was going to be grading it, it people got too upset. And also that it was becoming machine like there was there was several like studies that there yeah. was basically a strategy you could you look perfect to get an deep. essay. <laughs> yeah. Extend your word count and you'll get a good grade on the essay. Yeah. Good. So essentially, Mar I mean, I think we all agree, Marx is right in Fragment on Machines. A and Wilde says something like this also, although decades later than Marx, he wouldn't have read the Marx. But by the time Wilde is writing, it was more obvious. Humanity, instead of creating a machine in this Kropotkin way to, to make bread, humanity is serving the machine in exchange for bread and really not getting a good deal out of it. Does that sound right to everyone? Yes. Yeah, sounds right. What I can't see, but I'm nodding. <laughs> yes, let us all, we can all nod yeah. and do jazz hands. Jazz hands go great on, on podcasts. <laughs> yeah, the, the audio medium, um, which is yeah. terrible because I communicate mostly in body language. So I'm, I don't know, get a, yeah. we need some accessibility here. So I guess talking about that transition, so we talked a little bit about Marx in the text talks about this collapse of value as a potential uh, way for the transition to happen. And of course, Marx's revolution. Um, and then we also spent some time digging into some of the economic policies of post-scarcity. How do we achieve that? Yeah, good, excellent. I mean, one thing to say right now is like we, 
we have achieved post-scarcity right now in 2022 from a like calories and shelter point of view. We haven't reached, if post-scarcity is like anyone can have as much platinum as they want and use it to make a mountain, which is basically what is like in Star Trek. Like you want a guitar, you get a guitar instantly. But we've reached the point right now that every human being on earth could have food, shelter, clean water, clean air, et cetera. And we don't have that, which makes it clear that this is a, this is a political problem. There's a real techno utopian view that's like the politics will go away. Once we reach that, everyone can have everything they want instantly point of view. I personally do not believe that. I do not believe that either. Yeah, that, that there has to be a political change first, and then we can build further uh, capacity to make this utopia. Yes. Um, and so I guess one of the central conflicts between the anarchists and the communists is how how does this post scarcity come apart? Uh, co- come 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 into being? Is it because we have a big enough state such that we can coordinate these massive global supply chains? Or is it because technology has gotten to the point that we have like portable grape replicators? That was one of the analogies that we used. A grape machine. Heavily the grape machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is the that is the question. I mean, I think this is a this is a great way of of talking about anarchist communism, Kropotkin's version of communism versus versus Marxist communism, which would say, Marx would say, you know what we need right now? And I mean, I've seen even like left liberal, like almost center left economists say things like this. We just need a better run supply chain system that does a better job of delivering everything and is and is planned better. And what Kropotkin would say is like, no, you just need people who don't have to, you know, go do a job that is pointless in order to eat. And once you once you've got people out of these pointless jobs, I mean, this is Graeber's argument and why he advocates so strongly for universal basic income. Once you free people from this machine, the scarcity problem will take care of itself. And I. I really want that to be true. I don't know if it is, but I really want that to be true. I at least think that seems more plausible than that we're going to create a like really just and fair worldwide bureaucratic governmental distribution mechanism. Like I think that is the real fantasy and a William Morris Kropotkin style everyone just lives in villages with a few small factories that make pottery. That seems to be so much more likely than like that the UN is going to make sure everyone has enough rights. And I, I guess I'm on the exact opposite of that. Yeah, I'm, I think I am too. <laughs> so that was, that was actually an interesting part of teaching the course. So not to get into the weeds of this argument between the big social wealth fund versus the anarchist dream. Um, how, how do we present that? Because Graham wasn't teaching uh, with us, how do we present the anarchist argument in the best light, given that we are not all anarchists? It was kind of funny at times because we would just be like, because Mark would just sometimes say like, well, I'm doing the best I can, but if Graham were here, uh he might say it like this <laughs> yeah. i feel like i don't remember if this actually happened but i feel like sometimes mark was just like that's the argument i don't entirely believe it but i see like <laughs> the logic yeah yeah i Which guess very fun i don't know how much time we want to spend on this either this is probably the sort of thing so far i feel like this will be really interesting to the listeners at some point me, me and Mark arguing is of interest only to ourselves. No, but I think it's interesting. I would, yeah. I would listen to an episode. Yeah, we yeah. should make an episode where it's sort of that. <laughs> Larry <laughs> Summers and Graham Culbertson yell at each other for an hour. Yeah, I, can, I mean, I, can, I, <laughs> I, told you, I told you Brad DeLong is coming on the show. Yeah. So we've, we're going to, I'm going to talk to a center left Clintonite uh, economics 
economist, economics professor, economic historian. So we're going to have that. We're going to have that conversation. Um, and then after you can listen to that, Mark, and then you and I can talk. I mean, but to to represent the position, it goes something like this. I mean, this this goes all the way back to Proudhon, Bakunin, whoever you want. When you are assembling this system that is going to deliver food and shelter to everyone, someone is going to be running it. And as soon as they are running it, they are going to start diverting something, whether it's prestige, um, which is maybe okay, or resources to themselves. And then once they've got even just prestige, they're going to create systems of hierarchy. And then you're just going to end up with some sort of, even if the system does a good job of giving everyone beans and rice, which is the most I could imagine this system producing, no grapes, um, you're going to get uh, a, a meritocratic bureaucracy of discipline and punishment. That's the, that's the anarchist response to the like, let's just, I mean, and I, I've had a lot of guests on this show. Mark Pittman is one of them who are just, who feel exactly like you, Mark. And just like, you're crazy. We've got a big system. We have to fix the big system. We can't just walk away from it and, and let it collapse under its own weight. Maybe, yeah. maybe I am crazy. And I think the beauty of the corporation in the abstract, not in the real capitalist sense, is that you can separate control and wealth. You can have someone running the machine who has no expectation of receiving the rewards from the machine. And and I guess in that in that way, that's the beauty of bullshit jobs that Graeber describes, that we have these people going into companies, being management consultants, and not doing very much, and yet being so close to so much wealth. I mean, I would say Wild also, Mark, seems to agree with you that there can be some sort of, like, while most people are hanging around drinking champagne and writing poetry, there will be some sort of machine managing bureaucracy in the background. And Wild is like, and that's no big deal. Like, he did, Wild does not see it. Wild is a, He's a form of anarchist, at least in my reading, but he's not a he's not an orthodox anarchist. If there is such a thing, he's not worried about there being a government, as long as that government doesn't have the sort of power of violence, uh, of of uh, control over the bodies of the people via violence. He's like, fine, let there be a government. Seems like kind of a boring job, but there's probably someone who like gets off on making sure everyone has enough rice and let's just hope that yeah. person does it. And Oscar Wilde's going to go get off on, well, pretty much everything else. There's very few yeah, and I think Oscar I Wilde very much agree with pleasure. Wilde there. Yeah, sorry, there Mark, are, I was saying, yeah, I very much agree with Wilde there, that there are a group of people, and I, I, I think I, I could say that I'm one of those groups of people who like just has an interest in these intricate machines and building them and advancing them. Yeah, so we call this Starfleet, right? Yeah. It was like these people, or in an episode that maybe some of you watch called Family, which is one of the rare times that we see Earth, one of the very, very few times that we see people who are not in Starfleet. And there's two main visions of life that we see there. One is there's this guy who's like a groundbound technocrat who is like terraforming the floor of the Atlantic Ocean or something. He's like creating a new Atlantis. And like he clearly is getting no power out of this. He just likes doing it and it's going to make the world better. And we also meet Picard's brother, who is an old school, you know, 16th century style uh, vineyard farmer. Like he just is growing grapes and turning them into wine. And that's, and that's fine too. And in this system, you can have like slightly military bureaucrats, totally, and those military bureaucrats get the most prestige but it's also like no one's upset that they exist. They don't hold any power over anyone. Picard cannot command anyone <laughs> to do something that they really, really don't want to do. And he's, you know, you, Picard will never be called upon to put down the, the revolts, which will never happen because everyone's happy. And you have these groundbound technocrats who are just exactly as Mark has described, making the world a better place, making sure the trains run on time, but with no fascistic overtones. And then you've got your Thoreau, 
style. I'm making a farm. Fuck you, John Luke. Space is bad, and I like dirt people. And that's mm-hmm. fine too. Like all these people exist, and it just doesn't. It just doesn't matter because there's enough for everyone. Space is bad, and I like dirt. Is my new motto. Yeah, well, that's the thing. It's like, but yeah. It's, it's the same thing as when you go away to your fancy college. As the people who are just like, what do you need that for? Yes, I, it sucks being a farmer because I don't have enough money because of taxes and whatever. But I don't want my kids to have to go to a fancy school. Th- this is not me. This is the person who stays home. I was like, I- I'm going to send my kids to the fancy college because I have to. But if I knew they were going to be able to have shelter just growing grapes, Hell yeah, grow the grapes. And in fully automated, low grade gay space communism, those people get to, they get to exist. There's no reason for them not to. And they're working hard and doing something wonderful. Yeah, I, I think I really agree with that view. And that's where I diverge, I think, the most from the quote unquote serious leftists is that I think it's beautiful, the idea that someone does not have to do any societally productive work and yet we let them get champagne, we let them get the new iPhone, we let them have whatever. Yeah, Graver says basically the more money you make, the less good you do for society. Like the people who are picking the grapes, they make the least amount of money and, and sometimes are actually held you know, as slaves. And then your Jeff Bezos's of the world do nothing. Like, I read an article about how Jeff Bezos created Prime. I, I maybe I'll put maybe I'll put that in the um, maybe I'll put that in the uh, show notes as well. It's an amazing article. Everyone through it all just praises him. They just praise him and praise him and praise him. He came up with the name, and then otherwise people came up with ideas, and he said, "Yes, implement that." And they said, "No, this is too big. It's going to be too hard." And he said, "No, I'll just give you whatever resources you want." So he did literally nothing. To create Prime, besides coming up with the name, except tell other people they were allowed to. And they praised him, but I was reading this article and I was just thinking, did they notice that, like... The the only thing he could contribute was resources, and that's just because he's holding all the resources. The The only thing he actually contributed was giving them access to resources that he had no right to. So he did nothing. He but, actually made it harder. Oh yes, I would. I mean, I the thing that allows us to like binge watch Mamma Mia three times. I agree. He was a he was like a a a, a sticking point somewhere. Um, so yeah, I lost my train of thought. Billionaire's bad. Um, oh, okay. it was that he's Super contributing. Rich. He's contributing nothing. He's contributing less than nothing to the world, and he's getting the most. And then. The like in fully automated logic case based communism that will just go away, that will just go away, and in Marx's idea, and, and and I see this, I don't agree, but I see it. You can have these bureaucrat administrators, who don't, who are not specially rewarded, but are doing a good, and useful. Thing, as opposed to our current world, where the more useful the thing you do is, the less you are, paid. Yes, the the massive Amazon machine literally becomes a machine instead of a uh, some horrifying light electric and production machine of human misery. Yeah, this is a great like leftist goal. Leave Amazon as it is, nationalize it, mecha- mechanize it, and then everything is fine. And fully automated luxury gay space communism will will flow downstream from that. It does seem to me there's a lot of different ways to get to this. That's one thing, that's one thing I'm not worried about is, is picking the right one. It seems to me that as long as you're moving towards it, you will get there eventually. I don't, I'm not sure, but that's my, that's my sense. At some point, we should be able to get to it. Uh, regardless of path. Yeah, and like a universal basic income would be a more anarchist way of doing it. 
and a nationalizing Amazon would be a less anarchist way of doing it. But both of those routes, I do believe, lead toward this. The key thing is that we have this as our goal, that we don't want to shame people for not being productive members of society, nor do we want to elevate a group of people, whether the left wing calls them the proletariat, the right wing calls them the, the real Americans or whatever, but we don't want to elevate this group of people as superior. We don't want to invert the meritocratic pyramid. We want to get rid of it. And if you get rid of the meritocratic pyramid and you want everyone to be as you know, gay as they want to be, whether they go to space or not, <laughs> then you will get fully automated luxury gay space communism, whether you're starting with the Nordic model or starting with nationalizing Amazon or starting with a universal basic income. It's when you don't have that as your goal that you'll get bogged down somewhere. I hope. Yeah, I think that, that that's really the the dream, the view. Wow. Did um I mean this we talked for less than an hour and mm -hmm. it seems like we did it. Did we do it? I don't mean we did, I don't mean yeah. we achieved, it. I don't mean I we achieved so. a lot of learning based based communism, but we made a <laughs> we, we did in like 50 minutes a good primer and starting point for this idea and how it fits into various forms of leftist thinking, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like it. It's a cool idea. Yeah. I really like hour. it. It's a dense hour. <laughs> I was, you know, chatting with someone at the farmer's market who I recommended Kropotkin to, and she was like, yeah, <laughs> it's just crazy. <laughs> like, he's like, just give farmers what they need and they'll give you what you need and everything's fine. And she's like, it's crazy. And I said, yeah, but it's not crazier than like bankers get to decide who's a farmer. Like that's crazy. This fully automated larger gay space communism makes at least as much sense, if not much, much more sense than than what we have. And I happen to think it makes a lot more sense than orthodox Marxism or in any other vision of a leftist future. Yeah. 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 I think we, I think we did this. This was amazing. It was, um, it was really good. Final <laughs> thoughts, wrapping up, summations, anything? Um, there is something that I don't know if uh, uh everyone else knows about, but I discovered while um, looking at fully automated luxury gay space communism just in my free time. And it is another iteration called fully automated. Oh, it's like it's like fully automated uh, something. Queer, I think it is fully automated luxury queer space anarchism. Yeah. So the only difference is just like you change gay to queer and communism to anarchism. And yeah, I don't know. I wanted to know if you guys knew about that and what like your thoughts on it are. I just think it's fun that there's a new iteration too. Haven't heard of I'll it. I'll definitely check that out. Yeah, Seems I'll cool. have to check it out. Yeah, I don't think it has as much written about it. I think it's fairly new. Um, I just saw it on like, like mentioned in memes because that's, you know, what the youths do. <laughs> Mm -hmm. We we Gen Z. <laughs> I don't know. I think the name in itself is pretty cool, and I don't want to like dive back into another like conversation about it. But I think partially because it's a meme, helps it kind of like I don't know proliferate. Um, yeah, proliferate. I don't know. Um, because I found out about it through the meme, and when I actually looked into it and like looked it up, I was like directed to like Oscar Wilde and Star Trek. Um, so that's cool. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, calling it fully automated luxury queer anarchism, I mean, I'm probably even more in favor of that, of that name, but I'm mm -hmm. totally fine with the name we have. And the one thing that I would want us to avoid is leftist infighting. That's like, I mean, that's something that's yeah. that's I think that's the thing ahead, beautiful Mark. about the name, that it avoids infighting. Yeah, so Wilde says, like, call it socialism, call it communism, call it what you will. It's like, I don't fucking care. Wilde didn't care either. 
the important thing is that everyone wants it and we convince people that it's the world they want to live in. And for me, I spend very little time, probably less time than I should, trying to convince conservatives and right wingers because Your heart. it's just it's a it's a worthy project that I as a university professor who has a podcast about anarchism just can't do you know like they don't want to hear from me so my enemy is always the like sensible serious leftist whether like a center left liberal larry summers type or you know a doctrinaire orthodox marxist and like can't we just figure out something that we all want and can you maybe just tweak your ideas and make them a little bit more anarchist and then and then i'll sign up for your newsletter and yeah, by all means, call it queer anarchism. Yeah. All right, I think we're good. Yeah, Fully we're automated good. luxury gay space communism coming soon to a planet Earth near you. As long as you want it, and you should. Do you want it? Dear God awesome. knows. Um. Mark, Rook, Joy. I mean, first of all, thank you for making this class happen. Uh, after after I bailed on you for your senior year of high school to uh, sit at home. Okay. With a <laughs> Thank you for helping us for uh, uh, writing. <laughs> and uh, thanks for thanks for coming on the show. This was this was really fun. First, but not the last time uh, that my students will be on the show. And yeah, you, you three are all welcome. Mark is itching. I think Mark should be really <laughs> when I'm itching back for that episode. <laughs> right. Like that's one that the moment it drops, it's just ooh, my daily dose of drama. <laughs> yeah, I'll uh, definitely be tuning into that one. It sounds interesting. All right, well, it's a date. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you, Graham. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.